This podcast was originally released on February 26, 2018. This is the re-release of this episode for the first time on YouTube. With that, please enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Eric here, and we're back with another episode of Feeding Curiosity. And today I'm going to do a pre little preamble, basically going over what we did in this podcast, because it was a little all over the map. So today, as you already saw, the title is a random show. So Joe is home for spring break. It's a little early for Michigan, but there, he's home. So we got all together and I have joined by my brother and another one of my friends comes in a little bit later, Eric Herrera. And we just talk about all sorts of things that are interesting to us. Wow. Well, the sweater to adds to it. <laughs> nice. Daria bought me that sweater. Did she, <laughs> does Daria know that she made you look like a serial killer? That sweater is actually one of my favorite sweaters. <laughs> is he going to be Mr. Rogers? going to be walking? Hey, everybody. Take Welcome out this sweater. Welcome to my neighborhood. Let me tell you, let me hit you with a fun fact. Mr. Rogers sweaters. Every single one of them was made by his mother. Are you serious? Yeah, every, every single one of the sweaters. Wow. Yeah. Did your mom make yours? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> the better question was, Daria, did Daria make yours? Did Daria if, make yours? <laughs> if Target is my mom, then yeah. <laughs> no, Target's your daddy. I don't know where I was going. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. You can let the awkward sounds stand. <laughs> So, that's a preamble for the podcast. Welcome back to Feeding Curiosity, and I don't know where this is going. Welcome back to the Bro Pod Podcast. First one in a long time. Hey, how's it going? I'm <laughs> Joe's hijacking this podcast, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be drunken debauchery, or mildly drunken debauchery. <laughs> Give me some time. I'm not even... I've had a quarter of a beer. Oi. Oi. You turned very Irish at the end of that. Did I? A little mm, bit. Not very. Well, very is a strong word. Nope. Not my fault. <laughs> not my fault. <laughs> so, Joe, how goes spring break? Or rather, what, how does it go the events leading up to spring break? Dude, I had uh, fucking tests all last week, good old midterms, which is basically nothing but me being like... Caffeinated? Oh, yeah. <laughs> a fuckload of caffeine, a fuckload of studying. Not much sleep. I kept fuck... Oh, dude. So my roommates are just loud enough to wake me up in the middle of the night pretty much every single night. Oh, my God. Every single... There's... How have you not stabbed someone yet? Because you well, love their sleep. Okay, so first off, <laughs> A lot of self-control. <laughs> That's step one. A lot of fucking self-control. Step two is that, especially during the beginning when I first uh, moved in, I would just step outside and look at them like I was angry and then be like, stop. I just opened my door. Get off my And I'd lawn. look at whoever's in the fucking living room. And I'd say, do you mind? And then they'd be like, oh, sorry. I'd be like, okay. And I'd close my door. And that's usually just, that's all you have to do to get remind people that you're fucking sleeping. But... They've gotten better at it. Like, they used to just forget that I existed and then just come down and be like, whoa, fuck yeah, two in the morning, drunk off their ass. But now they're at least quiet. But the pro part of the problem is that those walls are fucking, like, paper mache. Yeah. <laughs> and then also, it's it's all concrete. Like, the, the ceiling is concrete and mm -hmm. the floors are, like... Because it's an apartment building, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a high rise. So just, like, concrete and then it's just, like, wood floors or, like, pseudo wood floors and then just blank walls and shit so everything the sound just reverberates so bad that mm. it's like if i'm in the kitchen if somebody's in the kitchen playing with dishes and shit it sounds like they're in my room banging pots and pans together jesus that's like, crazy it just reverberates like crazy it's i thought like, about buying a rug and buying some of those sound yeah but i'm also do i want to spend the money on it right yeah because that stuff is expensive <laughs> i'm just actually. gonna get like i don't know earplugs or mm. something that i can put in before i go to bed i've been they and it's not, this is, and like, I'm not angry at the dudes because it's not like it's their fault that it's fucking loud. And right. So, it, so long as they're putting in an effort to try to not wake me up, then it's, <laughs> there's not much you can do. So, I basically have just been waking up at two o'clock every morning. And when I was like, I would, especially this last week with midterms, it was like, because my, I would study right up until I'd go to sleep pretty much. So, the brain is like, just fucking going. Yeah. So, the second that I'd wake up in the middle of the night, it was like going again. And I'd, I'd be wide awake. Two o'clock in the morning. I it, had, oh, it got to the okay. point where I would just turn on fucking Netflix and just start watching shit until I could fall asleep. I was like, oh, fuck that. Just I like, got the first full night's sleep last night when I got in. For like Ten hours straight. <laughs> burning the candle at both ends. Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> That's, I'm, I'm ready for spring break. I'm not doing anything crazy. Just hanging out with homies. Having a beer. Doing a podcast. Yeah. I think, I think like now's the time to talk about what it's like the culture shock of, of the culture shock is University of Michigan. Uh, it's I've managed to damper it by 
basically only hanging out with veterans. <laughs> that sounds about because the only people that are going to understand your humor are going to be veterans. <laughs> right. And it's like the only people that I'm like relaxed around because right. you could say anything. You could say the most horrific thing you could think of. And, and they'd be like, like this rolls right off the back. Don't fucking care. Like nobody. <laughs> that's what I like about like the vet culture. Like there's a lot of things wrong with it, but, <laughs> but like one of the best things is just no, it's the least judgmental culture like ever. Like you could do anything and people will be like, I don't fucking care. Nobody fucking cares. Because <laughs> they know that you have the shared it's like, whatever. Nobody Real gives a shit. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's what it is, is it doesn't matter. Because you get, it's a culture, especially in the military. It's like everything is put up against people dying. Right, yeah. So if it's not as bad as people dying, for real... Then it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's I mean, all, that's what I it mean that makes sense, too, because if you're going to military, you're being trained how to kill other people. Yeah. So, it's, OK, if the type of person that could kill someone in combat and or at least be able to manage that level of stress. Yeah. Wouldn't it be fine. A, wouldn't it be a isn't the kind of person too? that would be sensitive. Like wouldn't you be, couldn't be sensitive. Isn't that like a coping mechanism, too, to make humor is the, the crazy making ridiculous jokes. Yeah. In the face of extreme like violence or something yeah in on killing by some dude that now i don't remember his name it's also a very highly recommended book really good book on (laughs) killing he talks about the coping mechanisms for killing someone in combat Mm -hmm. and i yeah just in combat and one of the big ones one of the primary ones is having a sense of humor so people make a joke about it so in saving private ryan and this is probably this isn't really a bad a good example it doesn't really capture it. It's more if you've seen uh, Generation Kill, that does it pretty well. Generation Kill na- kind of nails. That's the closest to actual how Marines act in a movie that I've ever seen. Most of the really? time or TV show movie. Most of the time it's like grandiose superhero esque, like stoic. And they become warriors. Like the stone faced Spartan type. It's romanticized. Look. Yeah. But in real life, it's just a bunch of dudes making dick jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. so that's the people I hang out with. So it buffers against the hypersensitive university culture that exists there. Yeah. And what, like, what about the type of people that go to that school? The people who are getting interviewed for different jobs and things? You oh, my God. Like- yeah. So one dude that <clears throat> I have, who is a veteran is just got interviewed by SpaceX. So he might end up working at SpaceX. There's dudes that have gone to Google out of the business school. There's like Fortune 500 companies left and right that recruit specifically out of the business school. I actually know more about where people go out of that, probably because they brag more about it. They they end up in businesses. On the high end, you end up in a business that's recognizable. You know what I mean? If like the equivalent to what I'm doing would be like if I ended up being a professor at a really good school. Yeah. That's the equivalent, but it's not it's not the same. Because mm-hmm. nobody's going to go on with a psych degree to go work for Google. No, <laughs> actually, because you could become part of the... Like, I be HR. Like an HR rep or some sort of psychological outreach type thing. Yeah. Where they or can... if I if I go and get a PhD in industrial organizational psych, where it's all... It's like organ- ergonomic stuff or... It's organizing businesses. Oh. That's Basically. where the money is, by the way. That is where the money is. That's where yeah. a lot of money... Because it's the only like private sector besides having... I've actually... Clinic. So, yeah, a lot of the newer companies... I forgot to mention this yesterday when we were talking a bit, and... So they're using the big five. A lot of the newer, like, oh, new age CEOs, they make sure that they test people on the big five. And then to a lesser degree, they use the Myers-Briggs. But then they look for that now. A lot of companies, That doesn't surprise me at all. Because, because they it, know it, they can pick and choose points to fit people into specific jobs. Like, they've then analyzed jobs to be able to... It's way better than... Oh, so if you're interviewing someone trying to get a sense of their personality where they're going to fit in the company, in an hour-long interview... How is that going to compare to a real psychological test? Hands, hands down, no comparison. It's nothing because they put on a face. <laughs> Unless too. you put them on a, in a very high stress and like, like task and be like, hey, f- solve this. Kind okay, of. Yeah, it depends on what you're looking for. Right. It's yeah. part of it. So if you want a middle man, <clears throat> what do you want from a, <clears throat> excuse me, a middle manager is going to be something like agreeable and then low in neuroticism. So that means that they're basically going to not be good at what do you call it negotiating for their money they're not gonna complain when you give them a fuckload of work Mm -hmm. they're gonna be really cooperative with their team members but because they're not neurotic they're also gonna be not very reactionary right now and from tim ferris's uh tribe of mentors one of the business leaders who recommended this said the killer combo he like laid out the top three it's probably industriousness agreeableness and and, openness uh, oh he likes creativity okay yeah because he's entrepreneurial type 
I would just think low in neuroticism because that makes sense. If that's you're, like if you're man- making decision making. It's any and- high stress situation. If you're yeah. low in neuroticism, it doesn't bother you. You just don't care. You're just like eh. you're just like nothing really bothers me. <laughs> I don't really give a shit. Things just roll off. <laughs> Extroverted would be good, depending. And if you're programmers, then you might be looking for introverts, or it might just not I feel, matter. I feel like yeah, for programmers, it makes sense. So I feel like the correlation between introverts and like programming is just a side effect of what the kind of like that kind of work does, because you're working with through your own thought process. Do you mean that the work is creating introverts? Or it just makes sense to be introverted. To it do might it. attract introverts. Yeah, because yeah, because you're sitting in front of your computer for many hours by yourself, thinking through a problem and typing away. You know what I mean? Yeah. You just become this, like, you need to be okay with sitting by yourself for long periods of time, to to actually achieve anything in it because it's not. Yeah, it's very solitary. It almost work. definitely attracts introverts because, in part, it's just not an. If you were an extrovert, you wouldn't find any joy by sitting by yourself working on a computer and not communicating with anybody <laughs> you know what fun is that yeah exactly but you, you if, gotta want to like and, and and again it depends i think the big ones that companies probably look for are industriousness which is just to qualify this is basically how hard you work though that's a really simplified version of it is going to be agreeableness so that you can work with people mm-hmm. and it's going to be creativity makes sense so openness is basically a creativity dimension yeah, I feel like we should define openness because that's. I feel like that one is not easy. It's openness easy to is understand. it's openness to new experiences. That's why it's called openness. Yeah. So it's like openness to so intellect. It differentiates into two different things: intellect and ooh, there's one other thing. I can pull it up. Yeah, if you, you want to keep I talking about other things. But so I'll explain it. Yeah. But so intellect is it's not intelligence like you would think. That's going to be something, another very technical. It's not IQ, right? No, it's not IQ. So you can be high in intellect and be an idiot. (laughs) That would be difficult because intellect is a dimension that measures the degree of interest in abstract ideas. So if you have high interest in abstract ideas, it'd be hard to do so if you didn't understand any of them, a.k.a. be dumb. Yes. And Eric Carrera's here. Yeah, so we can buy more time while I search this. You're in on this bitch. What's happening? <laughs> 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 he he walked down here. He's like a gazelle in headlights. Like, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> when the need. <laughs> but yeah, where is this thing? What do we got going here, guys? We're talking about spring break uh, and just how school's been going for Joe. What not? Crazy. It's been crazy. Yeah, I really like the psych stuff. I really like st- psych and I really like philosophy and the Asian history shit's cool, but it's our test. I don't know if I told you this. Mm. Our test, we had to, he gave us like our view sheet that we can look over and have. Here's what you should study. Mm-hmm. There were 150 different terms. Whoa. Six of which would be on the test. Three of which of those we could pick from. And that was the second section. The first section was an essay and the third section was a geographical thing. So it gives us a map without any borders on it. We have to be able to locate capitals and specific things. Is this a geography test? What is it? This is a third part of that exam for Central Asian history is the geography. Whoa. Yeah. Which you have to know. The fact that they got rid of all the borders is pretty intense. Yeah, so we had a quiz that had borders (laughs) and the test didn't. Wow. And then, okay, so just to circle back. So the openness, so it's openness to new experiences is the overarching category and it's broken down to intellect and openness. It's a little bit redundant. Oh, oh, okay. So openness general is a differentiation between the ideas and then the experience. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Because you could be interested in ideas, but not be like Mr. Go out and try new things all the time. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So just close that line off there real quick. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Defining terms. But um, as far as, so that test was basically me trying to fucking memorize everything about central asia <laughs> i was like that's, oh, that's a lot of stuff 150 turns I, some i didn't know that until somebody counted them it's 150 100, out of 150 so he's just some of these are gonna be in the test to figure it out <laughs> six of them are gonna be in the test so it's not even i need to know all of them i need to know six out of 150 <laughs> i'm like motherfucker <laughs> such a wide range for error but i fucking crushed it <laughs> yeah it didn't matter hey bitches <laughs> you to a boss that's true hey look hey preach i don't know it's fun though i like it it's just i know a lot of work it seems like there's pouring information into your brain right Dude, now it's i have to like really focus on the shit 
I have to find something about the class that I want to take with me. Otherwise, I'll lose interest. Yeah, exactly. Because it's yeah. so it's easy for psych, obviously, because that's like my main focus. I mean, that's like your thing. It's easy for philosophy because I just think it's interesting. And it fits right into the psych. It stuff. does fit. In. It's interesting. OK, so here's what I really like about what I'm doing right now. So my major is biopsychology, cognition and neurology. Whoa. So it's the best way to put it. <laughs> Is. You just blew Eric's mind open. <laughs> like, so the be- the best way to put it is if science was a or if psych was a hard science instead of soft science. So it's all brain shit basically, or will be. So I'm have that for the hard science, and then I'm doing philosophy minor for the soft science, so I can balance them out. That's a good idea, actually. That's what I want. I, I don't want to go all soft science because because it has no practicality. It's kind of like. It's hard to apply too easy. It <laughs> it's too. It's just. Too easy. It's a little too easy. I want it to be a little like grounded. You know. Well, what yeah, because I mean? you can go up into the clouds and be like, well, I can't definitively say anything. Yeah, you can go a little off the rail. You become that guy who's just the the armchair. One of the one of my favorite words is the philosophizer. So people who just look back at old people's works and talk like then continue to talk about their old stuff, uh, but, but touting them as like the pinnacle rather than pushing something forward does that make sense yeah i understand so you look back and relish in the yeah beauty of so the old philosophies philosophies and you never make anything new yeah then you, you don't try to step out of the shadow i guess so our philosophy course now is a is seven is history of philosophy 17 and 18 centuries so we're doing descartes we already did descartes we did spinoza Locke. we're on berkeley we're doing hume and kant Ooh, Immanuel kant is Immanuel kant so we're doing those, I know him. <laughs> but every, it's so funny because especially with Descartes, it was literally like, here's the cogito mm-hmm. and everything he tries to prove after that is shit. <laughs> like it's, we just turned it on it. It was like two weeks. Oh, here is this profound thinker's idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> and just I was shitting all over the whole time. <laughs> it was like not, it was. So he said, this is my favorite fucking thing that's ever come out of this class. You might like this. This is funny as fuck. So Descartes was like, I think therefore I am, which basically means the only thing that I know that can exist is that there's something producing the thoughts that I'm having and everything else could be fucking tetrahedrons floating in space. So he was trying to prove after that, that his mind and body were two distinct things that existed. He tries to prove that there's there's two distinct things. But then there's a criticism from Princess Elizabeth, Elizabeth of Bohemia, Ooh. which is, first off, a fucking cool name. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, she's like, how does a immaterial body interact or an Im- immaterial mind interact with a material body? Like, how does something that doesn't really exist make something that exists work? Like, that doesn't make any right. fucking sense. And his response was that there are animal spirits in the pineal gland that act as an intermediary. And this kid Logan that I sit next to, he's he's a cool guy. But every time something happens in this class now that sounds ridiculous, we turn to each other and go, animal spirits, man. That, that does sound like a dope alcohol brand, though. Bro. Animal spirits. I would right? have some Yo, the right? gland. Oh, yeah. Why? First off, why aren't we funding this? <laughs> yeah, I wrote it sure. down Well, right it's because now. we don't have any knowledge of alcohol creation. <laughs> but we'll ta- I'm seeing Bugle later. I'm going to talk to We'll talk to Bugle. <laughs> yeah. No, listen, buddy. Animal spirits. No, don't tell them the name. Exactly. It would work. Yeah, yeah. And they're called spirits because they possess you. That's the whole point. That's what I'm saying. Just like we tagged both of you in that meme yesterday. The tequila. <laughs> Diving in after that last shot. <laughs> <laughs> the best part about that meme is he's wearing a shark fin. Yeah. He just, <laughs> just salutes and just dives in. <laughs> just... And so now to diverge completely, you guys must have saw <laughs> that carnivorous plant I shared yesterday. Oh, dude, oh, that dude. was pretty awesome. Dude. <laughs> yeah. The, so the craziest thing about this, too, is that we're finding new plants still. Like, the surface of the Earth is basically cataloged, but we're still finding new things that defy the conventional rules of nature. And to say that a, a plant can swallow rats whole is pretty crazy. Okay, so this is running into problems in that it doesn't swallow shit. Technically, it, it does. keeps a thing inside of it. It slips inside of it. Different than swallowing. That's gay. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, still, it's still inside of it. Uh, and the other thing is, listen, 
Here's how we figured this out. I'm going to do a thought experiment to figure out if being inside of something is equivalent to eating or is Swallow. equivalent to just swallowing. All right. Uh, <laughs> here we go. Okay. Which one is which one's more gay? Being inside of someone or them swallowing something or you swallowing something? Wait a second. Hold on. We're deviating here. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's because do like no, I don't. No, Joe just tried to open his beer with his own hand. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I can only operate one major function at once. That's awfully all crippling. Like this. <laughs> We've saved Joe. He Good. doesn't have you to cut his hand. And maybe the conversation because I didn't know where that was going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah let, let me rewind here and bring it back to uh, the. the animals and the plants and whatnot and say that uh there's this, so. this whole like ecosystem on madagascar mm -hmm. that like one of one of the faces of the mountain range has nothing but i think they're stalactites the ones that point up but i don't like, remember i don't know the difference but i know Stalag yeah, yeah, but they're, they're basically the, those rocky formations <laughs> that are super pointy and they're always pointing up so there's no pretty much no like traverse no no way to traverse through yeah, this face of the mountain, but they just found I think thirty species of plants and a gecko and a spider and some other shit in there. I was watching it on uh, Nat Geo two days what? ago. That's fucking cool. Life will find a way. To quote right. Jeff Goldblum, <laughs> the myth. Any time that I'm wondering about something about biology, I always refer to Jeff Goldblum. Is that what you do, Joe? Absolutely, every mm -hmm. time. A, even though he's a mathematician <laughs> in Jurassic Park. <laughs> and the fact that I know that off the top of my head <laughs> and in real life he's just nuts is he crazy <laughs> you ever watched interviews with Jeff Goldblum he talks just like he did no. in Jurassic Park well, go, that's your homework go home <laughs> <laughs> go home and google like even his interviews when he was like doing press stuff for Thor he's absolutely insane his um, character was insane he Every interview, and I, I went down a rabbit hole one night, right? I just watched like 30 interviews of Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, he falls it's asleep. 3 a.m., you have bloodshot eyes, you're just watching yeah. Goldblum. It was bizarre. Jeff Goldblum, like, shirtless. Uh, yeah, but um, <laughs> it's, it's really bizarre because he, he does this thing where in almost every interview, he spins the interview onto the interviewer, and he starts to ask them questions. And it just gets really... Doesn't he know the rules? Yeah, well, it's, it's bizarre. He'll just, like, space out when they're asking a question with this goofy smile. And he's like, you fascinate me. Whoa. And like he's tripping balls. Oh, he's so, <laughs> he is the weirdest guy. Weird. But it's, it's a pleasure to listen to him talk. Definitely recommend it. He talks so I, I, I like. He like talks really like. Yeah, quiet well, yeah, he, yeah, he st stutters a lot like that. But I definitely recommend the Thor stuff and also him whenever he goes on uh, Conan. Oh, Those no. are both really funny. Oh, that has to be you know, it's got to be absolutely exhausting being like a late night host. Where you have to put on the plastic face every night and pretend to give a shit about this person that you are going to talk to for yeah, five minutes. Yeah, I heard uh, Leno <laughs> didn't even care half the time. Like uh, that was, doesn't surprise me. How could you? How could you care? Like you're talking to a thousand fucking people, like just rotating people out. And it's never deep conversation. It's what did you do on set? Tell me a story. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, plus well, you have your five minutes of like questions you wanted to ask about. So what about your new movie? And, and to book? be fair though, what I'll say. Your album. What I'll say about this whole talk show thing is that the questions aren't like they've it's not like Jimmy Fallon or anybody is sitting there going, oh, I'm genuinely curious about this thing. They ask them when they come on the show. Here are the questions that you're going to be giving. Yeah, yeah that's, that's are, common for talk This shows, is yeah. what we're asking you. Here's your answer. That's, you know, that's why I liked Craig Ferguson, because Craig Ferguson would take the cards at the beginning of every single fucking episode <laughs> and rip them up and throw them behind them. <laughs> yep. And then he bullshit with people. And but that's the thing. Like, sometimes it happens, but most of the time it doesn't. And realistically, the reason Jimmy Fallon exists is because he's PR. You yeah. go on Jimmy Fallon because yeah. you've got a movie, a CD, a record, uh, That's why I think, whatever. honestly, right. most of those talk shows are going to go to the wayside because many people get screwed over by those, like, 10, 15-minute blurbs because, yeah. because they become sensationalized. They just f try to find that soundbite that's going to get clickbait. And then you don't get really a sense of what... They're going to do the same thing. They're already doing the same thing the media does in general, which is just... You get shorter and shorter clicks. Yeah. Or shorter and shorter periods of time. Communicating less and less. And then they keep going for more and more Sensation extreme... Sensationalist. sensationalist things. That people just aren't interested in, but they're like... Desperately clawing at something. It's all... It, I honestly think that all old media is falling apart. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, that that property, the clickbait thing is just a thing that works. And that's not going away. 
And so I don't know about that. I don't think it's going away. I think it'll switch formats. It'll leave television but because you can. It's way easier to. Pr there's just less work. Are you talking like traditional TV? Yeah. Yeah. Well, traditional cable, TV in cable, general is cable just TV. that's blending in with all online media anyway. Well, so cable TV is going to. I don't. I think that. that entirely is going to change. But let's put it this way: people still watch the clickbait, quote unquote content on those talk shows but also might enjoy what traditionally would be like reading the newspaper or reading a book not none of that's gonna go oh. away it's just that there's different equivalents maybe now people don't read the newspaper they read their forums online and shit but they'll still look if bruno mars is getting engaged like it it's just oh great it's yeah. a person i know and that's a thing that's happening that's curious whatever i just think that the idea of the standard cable network is going to go away completely yeah, it's, it's relatively soon because I don't think any one of us would even consider buying cable TV. Here's what I would say straight up about all television period, which is just why in God's fucking name would I tune in at this time to watch this show when I could just stream it? Right. When you could choose it at your convenience to do I could something? just stream it. Yeah. And I, I don't think there's anybody who's arguing that TV is staying. Yeah. TV knows TV is. And that's that happened as soon as TiVo happened. But no, you know what they're just it doing. Started there. Yeah, I mean, what they're starting to trend. But. What they're doing is they're trying to milk it for the last bit of old people who still like the TV stuff. And they're trying to desperately figure out how to make money once they're gone. <laughs> the question is, is there are they going to be Netflix or are they going to be Blockbuster? Like yeah. right mm -hmm. net to preface this. I'll tell the story, which is that Netflix tried to sell to Blockbuster. Yeah. And they were like, listen, we just all, this is at the time before they were streaming on the internet and all they were doing was delivering shit. And it was a big yep. question mark whether or not it would even work. And Blockbuster laughed in their face and they're like, fuck no, well, that, there's no point in ever buying Netflix. This is a, a joke. Where's Blockbuster now? Where's Netflix? <laughs> what did Blockbuster do? Not innovate. Yep. What did Netflix do? Adjust. Adjust, adjust, adjust. And, and it's now still it has just like insane, it's huge. They have their own movie producing companies. And then I think they started a new, some of their new series are actually like episodic. So rather than coming out with their series all at once, they're doing like a weekly thing. I think one of their news shows is like that. I don't know if that's true or not, but I think I saw that. Whereas like every Sunday or something, there'll be a new they show. They might be. And nice. I bet they'll start simulcasting. I could see that. At least with anime. So like Crunchyroll does this. Okay, yeah. So, so for, for background, Crunchyroll. Crunchyroll is basically an anime streaming platform, right? Yes. And so what they do now is they have deals with the uh, animation studios in Japan where they simultaneously broadcast the anime episodes in the United States with subtitles. Oh, that's awesome. So now you can keep up to date on the same. It's not that like oh, year delay between. I remember growing up watching like Full Metal Alchemist and shit. And you, it, we were years behind when it aired in Japan. Right. You don't have to do that shit no more. I, I almost wonder too if. So I have Verve, which is another streaming service, but it's an amalgamation of multiple services. So it's oh, like cool. Crunchyroll's in there, Funimation's in there. So I can okay. get subs and dubs for anime. And uh, Rooster Teeth puts up stuff on there. So it's what like they have Rooster Teeth like first. Their... It's like extra content oh, okay. so on some there. podcasts and stuff that aren't available. Or gotcha. like they, their documentaries are up there, mm -hmm. which are pretty good. I like their documentaries. That's another innovative company that you never would have expected to be right. in they, the world. They, they keep are. doing new things. That's what does it. <laughs> but it's an amalgamation of all these different like-minded channels in a sense. And I almost wonder if that's not going to be the natural progression of things. I think that what might happen is that this is really speculative and almost way more likely to be wrong than right, is that if YouTube falls apart, that what it'll turn into is a bunch of different versions of Verve, where you just have different... Like Twitch. You have video. websites, right? You have a Twitch for gaming. You have yeah. a Verve for like anime. It's that nerd culture. You have another one that's for sports. You have another one like that's Vimeo's for Like Vimeo is for like news. those, for like the hardcore slash like... <laughs> right, hardcore, I mean... You're hardcore already, entertainment, hardcore like music video crowd who does puts a little bit more effort into the quality of the video. I, I wonder if you won't end video. up with chant with websites that host a specific subculture of internet like mm -hmm. uh, subculture subculture of the internet. So you have we have we already have that. We have Tumblr, which is a different culture yeah. than Reddit, which is a different culture than 4chan, which is a different culture than any of these forum sites. You just transfer that same concept into the video world. Yeah. So that kind of goes into, so YouTube, after all this controversy of what YouTube went through in 2018 and the Logan Paul thing and everything like that, they sent out a thing, like a newsletter with the five things they want to do for YouTube basically going for this year. And they have two, two things for like advertisers, like 
making YouTube safe again with the the children thing where like those videos that were completely inappropriate yeah. being played and then now with some of their bigger names getting you know pulled because they were being inappropriate they want to get more tools on that and then they added a new thing that Nick showed me actually yesterday called sponsorship so it's you can give a monthly like four ninety nine or whatever I don't know if you get to pick or not but okay, except by whoever yeah, it is yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how that works yeah. but basically you, you can subscribe to a channel just like you would on Twitch where you pay a monthly thing to that YouTuber to give them basically a salary so you can still subscribe for free, but then you can sponsor okay. them for money. They're trying to they're trying to get behind. Um, so Philip DeFranco has his elite. Yes, exactly. And you have uh, Rooster it's Teeth has the income. first. It's they're trying to offer another avenue for that same thing, but through YouTube. Right. Yes. And so yeah. and it, it essentially works exactly the same way as any of those other things work. So you have to give without to, actually going to Patreon to do yeah, it. Yeah, you you have to give two quote unquote incentives for people to do it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you loyalty know, reward basically. Yeah. Regardless of that fact, that's where I think we're probably headed, is that it won't necessarily be a website that's in control. YouTube's not going away anytime soon. And what it seems like they're trying to transition just for the creators it themselves is to say subscription. YouTube I'm sure it will always have ads, but they're gonna try to make it so that you're supporting whomever you watch directly so um rather than by click through ads yeah CPM. and and i don't again i don't know how that works maybe it disables ads mm -hmm. and then youtube gets a portion of that revenue i don't know i'm sure that's probably how it works or they but keep all or they keep a larger portion of ads. if revenue. i was i'm right. just i completely agree start there <laughs> <laughs> and then what i would almost say is if i was a creator i don't know if i'd be i would Take advantage of that platform, absolutely. And I would still diversify outside of it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that could be, it could be the case that even if YouTube doesn't go away, we still end up with outside sites see, that amalgamate see the good these thing, different So the good right, thing with that though, with your, that idea there, so say you get big enough, right? That you can make a YouTube channel that's sustainable in some way. You can then have <clears> your own sponsorship on YouTube and gives just a little bit of extra to those people who feel like your content is worthy of them paying you directly on YouTube. But they really like it that much and they want to put a little bit of money, which for the vast majority of people, five bucks a month, that's... It's not much. That's nothing. But you multiply it by 100,000 people, that's like a decent amount of money. <laughs> hey! <laughs> you know, like these things, all you need is a thousand people to be profitable. Yeah. Or whatever, depending on how much you pay. The ROI is different. It's the same thing as the Patreon concept. Yes. It really right. And it's really interesting. And then the, so the last part about YouTube, what they want to do is that their fifth bullet point was that we want to leverage educational tools on YouTube. So they mentioned all the fact that there's lots of educational tools on the internet like that you pay for as classes, uh -huh. like structured things. But you can find some of the same things, if not better quality, on YouTube if you just look a little bit. And they want to try to find ways of highlighting those things instead of having trending videos that are more, you know, news related or stuff that's... If they can get that to work... Yeah. That's good. The Revolution. Univers universities are fucked. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's one of my... They're, they're Why would I spend $100,000 on tuition? When I could get it for free on YouTube. Well, and, <laughs> right. and so here's the problem that's going to that's gonna run into that. Accreditation. Um, accreditation will be the biggest issue that this is going to cause. And regardless of what you think about it, degrees hold merit. And when someone goes through that formal training, I know somebody who's gone through a university track that's accredited knows a certain degree of something. Yeah. That's guaranteed to you as an employer. And it's going to be a heck of a lot harder to be able to quantify or qualify the experience someone's had if they said, I've watched three to 4,000 hours of videos telling me. I'll Here's my question to that, though, as a rebuttal. You can go to university and pass with C's. They don't ask how well you know a thing when you have your degree. To say someone is, quote unquote, capable of doing something versus knowledgeable is two different things. OK, so the implicit statement in there is that there's a huge schism between it looks like there's a time delay it's our expectations of what accreditation means versus what it actually is so you have this like you have a kid with the university maybe he went to a great university. maybe he went to harvard right yeah just to throw it out like so maybe crazy. he got seized the whole fucking time and whatever degree classes or whatever other classes didn't give shit got by on his whatever and then got a degree that is whatever. Who gives a fuck? Underwater basket weaving. Who gives a <laughs> shit? But they're like, he went to Harvard. Yeah. And it's accredited. 
in the weight of Harvard and gets him into an amazing job. Yeah, so he works in HR or whatever. But if you have same someone who decides to learn that same thing because they're that interested in it, I would say for their own free time, let's say they're working all the time or whatever they're doing, would mean a lot more to me. Yeah. And the university system operates on 1800s proto-fascist <laughs> German idea of factory workers and that you could basically just put people on an assembly line in a school and that they'll come out educated. It doesn't fucking work that way, period. <laughs> You're not a, a, a skill set is not a construction in a factory assembly line. Yes. So one that has to change. And that started and it, with Henry Ford to be able to convince people to... To work in an assembly line, they have well, to revamp the education so, system. So let me ask, just out of curiosity, what's your feelings towards general education? General education? Like gen eds. Oh, gen eds? Like, okay, so gen eds are necessary. Right. Um, so the reason that they're necessary is it adds a... One, it does a couple different things. So it, the first is that it gives a foundational understanding of the world, mm -hmm. which is something that you need. So right. I think that the humanities are really good at providing an understanding of the culture that you live in. Yes. So it's, I'm going to have to operate in this world. I should know where it came from, the thinkers that helped produce it, why they thought that, why things have changed, why things have progressed this way. Not just that they have, which can be helpful because you can move forward from that, but also why they did that so that you can understand the mistakes that they made and learn that thinking to be able to think at that level right. the same that they were. Yep. The other reason is that it also, especially when you're young, presents all the options to you. Mm -hmm. So you have a chance to play in all these different playgrounds you don't and see which it. game you like the most. Yep. Now, here's where uh, the whole self-teaching thing falls apart uh, right now. And that would be that most people aren't driven enough to care about l any of that stuff. And even to, to a lot of degrees, the guy who's getting C's in, in a university and learning, even if he's not learning a lot, he's passing, which means that you have a certain amount they wouldn't do it on their own. So I don't think they're going to pursue something like that. That yeah. just wouldn't happen. And the same goes, especially for those general education things. Like if you're not in a, in a university that's forcing you to write papers, learn about humanities, do mathematics, any of that stuff, chances are, if you're not interested in it, you're not going to do it. You need, a, you need a fire behind your ass. Also, I think what part of, of the university stuff does, it, it makes you do stuff. Yeah. Whereas self-teaching, they can't, you can't, but you won't necessarily do that. If you don't feel like it, you might not. I feel and like most people he, aren't yeah. that driven. And yeah, so it's, it's almost, I feel like the one thing is that there's a loss of lateral thinking. When people go into a classroom, like a specific classroom, they sit in there and they're like, why the fuck am I learning this? How does this affect me? Or anything else I'm taking? Everything feels like its own disjointed bubble. I don't know. I think in that depends way. on your education. Like, especially... Well, I think like, that depends on how lateral I'm thinkers about, your professors I'm, are. Yeah, I'm talking I, about yeah, gen eds in general, because they all feel very watered down and draw... Like, Hyper-specialized. Mm, no, it, it depends. It depends where you go. And this is an extraordinary case. For the school I'm at, they... they, say, they it for, say it for reference. Columbia College in Chicago. It's an art school. They acknowledge the fact that no one there is there for gen eds. And so they really do put in the effort, it seems, to say, hey. To connect it to Right. They, they say, we realize that you're musicians and you're artists and you're whatever. Here's how this public speaking, for instance, is going to benefit you. And this is what you need to get out of this. Or That's good. I think and, and that's, that makes they sense. They need to frame it. That makes sense. People are why to understand. Right. And to why. give them any motivation. Yeah, because if there's no why, then why do it? And to that credit, <laughs> what I'll say, going from what I would consider to be a, a much more conservative community college to a very liberal art school, the art school has the most engaged classrooms I've ever seen. Whereas in, in that regular college experience of like, you go and sit in a lecture of 80 people and everyone's like passing out, sleeping, not really saying anything, doesn't raise their hand. Doesn't show up for class. Doesn't show, yeah, <laughs> maybe just doesn't even show up. At this school, everyone pretty much shows up and everyone's pretty much talking about stuff. And <sighs> so it, it's really interesting that way. And I think it's, it is because they are connecting things because... with what you're doing. They realize that you're not there necessarily for that class, but this is what you're going to need to take out of that class. It might be a shift in the culture between, between fucking junior colleges and a, like a university, like the place where you're going. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Like I know I can see that same thing happening at Michigan. Mm -hmm. It's It's the same. It's like... Nobody fucking talked. Nobody really gave a fuck. But when I go to here, especially like in discussions, so I have the lectures and I have discussions on top of it. So you go to the discussion, your GSI teaches you shit. 
mm-hmm. whatever on top and explains what the fuck you didn't understand <laughs> in that lecture of 300 people so god that's a lot of people <laughs> that's for i think yeah developmental psych's like 300 it's a lot less for my other classes but everybody that's in the discussions is discussing yeah you know what i mean is that a gen ed class or is that no. very specific? See, and I think that's also a big part of it too. Yeah, I think it can fulfill. I think it can fulfill humanitary. So, humani- yeah. so here's humanities an, requirements. So here's another level too. I I've, I was listening to one of the mixed mental arts podcasts, and they they talked about education too a little bit, and they said that a lot of the gen ed classes, for at universities, the, the way they structure them is so that they weed out people who are not built for that degree. Mm. Does that make sense? They're so, t- okay. so they so go to they're a, teaching to the person that's going to go for the major, right? Yeah. So they try to make it as a gateway, so that if you're really into this stuff, you're going to find the things they're teaching super interesting, and then dive deeper. Into it's a it. trial by fire, exactly. <laughs> and I think that's important though too. No, it, it is because you do have to weed out the people that. I are. mean, like when I went to Harper, the the professor who taught the introductory umbrella course, he was the head of the department, so he was able to see everybody coming into the program mm. and. Like at a much smaller scale because like lecture halls in in big yeah. universities are three hundred plus people, whatever. Whereas my class had twenty people in it. Yeah. But for him, it's easy. He's able to do that, have a hands on basically, and see he, who's ready. He gets ready. to sift through it a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So it's That's... the same nature of the beast there, which is I think also important too when you have those types of things to sift through. It's good. It's good. And it's not just good for the school. It's good for the, the students, too. Right. Because, because maybe you think that you're going to be a fucking history major. Right. And then you get to your maybe you go to a school that doesn't do that mm-hmm. and that you get three years into it. And then you realize maybe I'm not cut out for this. You get to the advanced level courses and now you're like, oh, this is. I don't know how interested I'm in in this if it's going to be like this. Right. Yeah. Which right. if you're going to be a history major. You have to be fucking competitive because <laughs> there's a lot of people like history. There's not a lot of people that can write fucking textbooks for history or the yeah. only, what else do you do with a history major? <laughs> Become a curator at a museum? Yeah. Uh, you can work in public records. You can, Okay, I can see that. You can actually do the research. I still know, imagine there's... that there's quite a f- small amount of jobs and a lot of people. Yeah, I don't know. Are there a lot of historians? I don't know. We can put it to the side. I don't want to get caught on the point. Oh, right. <laughs> but, yeah. but the other factor would be that basically that if that same student went to a school where their 100 level was competitive and was trying to weed them out, they might realize they might waste less of their time. And that's it. Like, so be it. And that's a good thing. That's not disappointing. It might feel <laughs> disappointing, but in the long run, it's like relieving <laughs> because yeah. you didn't waste four years of your fucking life. I mean, I'd rather waste, yeah. a, I'd rather waste a lot one, of money. <laughs> I'd rather waste one class than, yeah. <laughs> yes. than multiple years of my effort to realize, oh, freak. Like, I'm <laughs> screwed. I just waste my time and now I have to do the good old switcheroo junior year or whatever it is. And there's a certain <laughs> point, there's a certain point where people don't turn course anymore you well, yeah I mean? because they're like, you already... get your degree and you're probably not gonna go you know what this isn't what i wanted to do let me go get another one <laughs> some people do that though <sighs> those yeah, people I know, balls of dude. steel i had, a, I had a professor uh, to get those one, multiple degrees one of Fuck. one of my <laughs> favorite design professors from uh harper was this woman who for years, was an executive in pharmaceuticals. Spirits. <laughs> she, she, was, she was an executive in pharmaceuticals. And uh, one day was like, yeah, I'm not into this. I like art. And so she went back to school, got both a BA and a master's in oh graphic God. design, became a designer and went, I'm not in all these deadlines. And so then she became a professor. Wow. But a professor in design specifically. Does but, she have a family? No. That Which is also a big part. She was a husband. Poor bastard. But, well, <laughs> well, the both of them, though, the both of them, they switched places. They they both seem really eccentric. Let's put it that way. They're probably really, okay, grounded. They're probably both really high in openness. Yeah, and so just to give a little bit of profile, I ended up becoming pretty close with this professor before I left, but she... She and her husband were the type that like that were like not necessarily willing to get married. They were like marriage is dumb. 
kind of thing. We're not going to get married. Yeah. But then they got married because it made sense for taxes. So, <laughs> so they did. And he was an artist and she was an executive. And then he became an executive, like some sort of director kind of, kind of guy. And she became a teacher, graphic designer person. Wow. So they switched places and all that. And Good for them. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And they have tons of money and they, they live up in the big houses and all that stuff. Yeah, they don't give a fuck. But yeah, they, don't, they don't have kids. They don't want kids. They just don't care. They're just like, this is cool. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of benefits to not having kids. Hell yeah. There's also to stay on the education topic a little bit is that you just straight up you can also choose not to fucking have an education. Yes, you can just not go to higher education. Yeah. And I think you're a fucking great example of this with your tower climbing shit yeah. because you can do just fine. You on, fell into it too. You can learn <laughs> a technical job and do fine. Right now, I know a guy who is making a ungodly amount of money working for I think it's Caterpillar. And they, yeah. mm. they've lived in Paris. They've li- they're living in Shanghai right now. Wow. He, he's like, yeah, fuck it. I'll take my family. We get to go all over the world. They Their kids know three different languages. Wow, like, that's crazy. And he, you don't need an education for the job that he has. Because there's these big manufacturing type companies like that. Caterpillar, yep. um, Bobcat, these people. I work with all those companies too. <laughs> they'll hire people. No education needed. Mm-hmm. And you can... If you're, I'm not, I'm shit you not. By the time you get to like upper middle management, you're making six figures. At least. Yeah. With no college education. There are kids right now who are getting their degrees that are going to get out of college with $100,000 in debt who aren't going to make up. They're going to make less than six figures easily, at their fucking job. And you can easily fast track yourself if you go to get a two-year degree in some sort of quote-unquote. But I guess 10 years ago, it would be considered more vocational. If you got welding or machining or something like that, electrician type work, you get a two-year degree in that, you can fast track yourself into a company like that because those are hard skills, right? Those skills are yeah. sure. Sure. Maybe that's going to become automized in some way, but someone's still going to have to learn how to use those machines. Yeah. The, the construction side of it. You're not going to lose people for a long time on right. that. If you have people that are just certified to, and it's just certified to be able to operate those vehicles or repair those vehicles. is insane. Or manage the people that do it. Mike Rowe. He's, he har- he's the most he's the most vocal advocate of the working class of America in general. Like just voca- just vocational skills. Well, because he, he, he so get into a trade. I heard him on he was on Tim Ferriss's podcast what, like a couple years ago, but I listened to the episode like a little while ago and he, he talked about that. And he's like he had a love so initially he went to school, he's like an opera singer and stuff like that. Artsy. Yeah, he's it's crazy, it's weird. Cool. But <laughs> he's so really he, good too. Yeah, he's really good. Really? But, yeah, um, he's really good. His grandfather really forced him to try and learn those hard skills. But he didn't appreciate it when he was younger, as most people probably when you have oh you're all, I don't wanna do this. Right, really. kinda. Of. <laughs> but I wanna play with my friend. Realized that in his like after his grandfather passed away, the show of dirty jobs that came up to him was it was like his way of paying a homage to his grandfather. Anyway, because his oh. grandfather worked at a factory and was an electrician and a woodworker and yeah. all that stuff oh, nice. that, that he was like back then, like in the 50s and 60s, 40s, if not earlier. Like they had to learn everything because who are you going to call? Like there wasn't going to be yeah. a polymer and a... You mm. still see that. I see that with my dad. He still does. Your dad definitely All his that. housework, all his kind of shit. Yeah. I'm not doing any of that. I'm, <laughs> my goal is just to get rich enough that I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a nanny and a fucking cleaning lady and I don't give a fuck. I'm going to sit back and be like, it's a little dirty over there. Do you mind? <laughs> Martha, there's a big steamer in bathroom three. <laughs> that shit is happens. squawked. <laughs> on, Joe's, on Joe's intercom in the bathroom. <laughs> Man, please. I just shit myself. <laughs> on the intercom, just... <laughs> <laughs> Martha, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Martha, please. Which, what, is Joe going to be three hundred pounds? Please. <laughs> After he yes. All right. Listen. The second I get married, I'm just letting myself go. <laughs> I'm never working on a day of my life after thirty. So help me God. I'm gonna be a fat motherfucker sitting in that bed. Martha, please. Martha, can you break the wheelchair? I can't. I can't move. <laughs> oh God. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you're downstairs, go ahead and bring me up a cannoli. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, let's not waste time. I, just because I'm sitting on a toilet doesn't mean I can't eat. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is, folks. There it goes. This is why this show is called The Random Show. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't got to laugh that like that in a while, Joe. Yeah, no, I don't get to make jokes around these fucking sensitive <laughs> children. Yeah. <laughs>
you, before you got here, Joe was talking. He's like, so yeah, I can't really make jokes without people thinking I'm, ha- I'm full, crazy, full insane. <laughs> oh yeah, we definitely have a way different sense of humor. I know. Dude, here's what I realized. So I had to like seriously adjust because <laughs> I got there and I was I'm I'm so comfortable with you guys being comfortable translated to them. So I just be me. I'd be like, yeah, totally. Let's just fucking like oh, listen. I'm saying that totally my <laughs> like this kind of shit. And they're like silence <laughs> there are multiple jokes i would make with no reaction <laughs> the sideways looks of like whoa not even disgusted just awkward mm-hmm. quiet i'm okay with this joke but i feel like it's too soon for him to be moving this fast <laughs> i don't know it was a lot of that it was like this person i don't know this guy why is he cracking jokes at me <laughs> i'm just being friendly I don't get it. I think I'm just being friendly. I'm like, I they think I'm crazy. <laughs> I, I got to fuck around. Of course, it was with the bad guys, but we were watching the Super Bowl and me and this, the guy, the Animal Spirits guys, Kid Logan, are sitting in the back, like on the couch. And everybody's like, in front of us, so they can't really see us, but they're watching this. And we were doing like 1940s, like transatlantic accent narrating the Super Bowl. Like, and he runs to the Super Bowl. Oh, and he fucks it up. I'm sure his mother's really disappointed him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tom Brady drops the pass. <laughs> there goes that Super Bowl. And we we're just doing this the whole fucking time. And people were dying. <laughs> it was great. That was fun. I like that. That's like Mike. He turns into one of those announcers for Animal Planet when we play video games sometimes. Oh, uh, yeah. And so he'll be like, he's like, so we're going to go here? Yeah. that very dry, dull English voice. <laughs> like, okay, Eric, so we're going to start this camp. And then after this camp, we're going to rotate to midline. <laughs> after that rotation, we're going to go for a gank on the Nova. And notice how the dew on the leaves <laughs> slowly yeah. drips down. That's exactly oh. what it could have been. Like, like it could have been like one of those gazelle cheat, like the, the hunting of the leopard. <laughs> yes. And the water buffalo notices he slowly the lion no, he, and the No, he just keeps rats. going. It doesn't matter how like intense something gets. He just <laughs> like, keeps going. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, my mind went to like him in a war scene in a movie. That's exactly and what it's like though. When it's, and my friend just died beside me. <laughs> that's literally as the bullets and carnage litter like the a, beach, I continue <laughs> forward <laughs> to like, press the line. It's quite literally... Exactly what he does. But in real time. <laughs> <laughs> pretty fucking annoying. <laughs> the worst. work as a team and he's over here narrating the team fight in like the most dreariest voice <laughs> ever. And there's so much shit happening in a five second team fight. <laughs> and he's talking in that slow ass voice. It's already so happened. the whole team fight. He narrates the whole team fight for a whole 30 seconds afterwards. It's happened. We're like still trying to play the game. And then Eric died due to the Sunda from Thrall. That was 30 seconds ago. <laughs> Get with the times. Get with the times. <laughs> Oh, man. The worst, though, was when he banned himself from his computer and decided to play a, one of those looping laugh tracks. Like the, oh, no. What was it? Duke Nukem was he playing? Or Arnold Schwarzenegger? It was a whole bunch of shit. He just had a whole bunch of soundboards on. Me, me and Eric were trying to play, and he's just... <laughs> just fucking hitting, like... It started out with the Vuvuzela. The... <laughs> the air horns. <laughs> and we're like, all right, Mike. All right, no, no, no. I'm sorry, guys. I, 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 get, I get better ones. But no, there, there is no better ones. Just like, just don't do it. <laughs> it's all shit, Mike. <laughs> sure enough, dude, we just start spamming the fucking, oh my God. The, our voice chat. With Jesus. fucking all this nonsense. Eventually, we muted him. Yep. That bitch. <laughs> We're an hour in. Yeah, we are. Wrap it up. Sure. I'm, I'm fucking hungry. hungry. Yeah. yeah. We're apparently all hungry, so we're going to go get some food. I hope you all enjoyed the first mm. edition of the random show of the Feeding Curiosity podcast. It was very random. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I wrote all the show notes down of mentions of stuff and things to give you some sort of quote-unquote cohesion. Good luck. Yep. That's all I'm going to say with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Till next time. This is the Broad Pod Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. This as is on my, my channel now. Fuck you, Eric. Joe, Joe <laughs> hijacks the podcast again. <laughs> Again. 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 Again.